it's just a huge honor today for me to be podcast interviewing my idol, my role model, Dr. Byung Sa, who I've had the pleasure of uh, listening to lecture several times over the last 30 years. Dr. Byung Sa is the founder and president of Bisco Dental Products Incorporated, which is located in Schaumburg, Illinois. With his background in research and chemistry, his focus at Bisco is on dental materials, research and product development. He has over 30 patents and 19 patents pending and has published more than 30 articles and 80 abstracts. Dr. Sa has become a well-known and sought-after lecturer and teacher lecturer extensively in the U.S. and Canada, as well as in over 40 countries internationally. He has given more than 250 lectures and presentations of various dental associations and research conventions around the world. I have been trying to get you on the show for two years, and I finally did it. Thank you so much for coming on today. How are you doing, Doc? Very good. Thank you, Howard. It's my pleasure to be talking to you. And I think this is the first time I'm doing in this format in adhesive dentistry. <laughs> I know. This is your first <coughs> podcast, and it took me two years to get you, and it's just a huge honor that you came on the show today. Um, there's so many kids out there that see the name Bisco, and they don't know who started Bisco. Just like they'll see Glidewell Lab, but they don't know there's a Jim Glidewell. And you have the most amazing story. And I wish we'd start out with just saying, how did you get into dentistry? Tell them your story. From where? <laughs> From birth. Say, where, where were you born? Seoul? So I, actually, I was born in Korea, South Korea, Taegu City, southern part of the city. And then I went to uh, Seoul for college. And then I finished college, and then I worked for about four years in chemical plant making urea fertilizer, uh, which company was built by American Aid, actually. So many American engineers and chemists were working there. That's where I spent about four years before I came to the United States. And why did you come, why did you leave Korea and come to the United States? Oh, well, you know, while I was working with American uh, chemists and engineers, I became aware of that, okay, I need more advanced study. I like to do it, but America. So, uh, you know, at the time, Korea was very economically poor. So nobody had, nobody probably could afford to send a, their kids to United States as students. So I am in the same category and uh, so I saved money during four years for airfare and maybe one semester living cost in America. And so I left with $50 in my pocket, which they allowed a for a student going out to study, fifty dollars. It that's it because they didn't have any foreign currency, you know. So that was a legal money I could bring. The fifty, and then a friend of mine gave ten dollars. So I had a sixty dollar arrived in San Francisco, January thirties, nineteen sixty four, long time ago. And then I finished school after four years. And then came to Chicago, and uh, well, before I came, maybe I should give a little bit of uh, life I spent in student time. Uh, after first semester is done, summer vacation came, so I had to make money. So first I went to a restaurant. Could you give me a dishwasher job? And uh, Ona said, do you have experience? I said, no. I should have said yes, but I should... Honestly, I didn't have experience in dishwasher, and they didn't give me a job. And at the time, a friend of mine was working as a busboy in Reno uh, Sahara Club. I called him up. Hey, I cannot even get the dishwasher job. He said, well, if you come to Reno, I'll get you a busboy job. He was a student from Brigham Young University, so he was uh, summertime. He gets there to get a job. So I went to Reno, I got a busboy job and went, worked for four months, or uh, three months, summer vacation. And so I saved enough money to register next quarter or next semester. And then about Christmas time, money ran out again. 
So at the time, at the same school, there was a, a friend of mine, a few years older than me, was a bellhop at Hilton Inn in airport, in, in uh, San Francisco airport, Hilton Inn. So I asked him to get, get me a job. So he sent me to see J. Bell Captain. So I met him. He said, well, if you, your friend's name was Mr. Moon. Mr. Moon sent, I'll give you a job. However, working hours are followed. Saturday night, 11 o'clock, till Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. And Sunday night, 11 o'clock, Monday morning, 9 o'clock. Can you do it? I said, no, I can do it. I mean, no, I have no... Uh, way of making money other than that. So that was a nice job because it's weekend, except Monday you have to go to school. But I did it until I got scholarship within uh, one and a half year. Then I was okay. But anyway, that was my student life, about one and a half year, working as busboy and Bella. So where did you meet your lovely wife at? In Chicago. Actually, when I came to Chicago, I met. So, so let me explain that. Uh, well, so after finishing school, I heard many jobs will be available in the Chicago area. I came and got a job as a chemist. First time was a medicine chemical. And uh, then actually I met my wife briefly at the church, Korean United Methodist Church where some of my friends introduced my current wife, and that's how I met. And then we have three daughters. That's the only complaint I have, no boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have all boys, no daughters. I've had uh, dinner uh, with your daughters before. They're so amazingly intelligent. One's a lawyer. T two of the three work for you. One's a lawyer, right? No, no, not a lawyer, more, no, actually, not, none of them are lawyers. First one is more like a CPA, oh, okay. at MBA from MIT, and then second one is uh, like a international marketing from Brown, and third one is actually architect. Wow, that is, that, that is an amazing, that, that, that's a... Uh, that, what an American story. I mean, all of America was just built on 500 years of immigration and we've been, it's been a brain drain of the world. And I wish, I wish we could get back to our roots. So, so you got a BS, a bachelor in science, a master's in science and a PhD. How did you end up in dentistry? <laughs> well, that's probably because I got a second job in Chicago. Actually, I was working in as a chemist in first job, my boss technical director was moving to another company. That was later found out there was a W.A. Erickson and Company. So uh, then my boss from first company asked me, hey, Byung, do you want to follow me where I'm going? I'm moving to another company. So obviously, he kind of liked my work environment or work attitude. So I said, okay. So I followed him. So I found out there was a company called W. A. Erickson, which is a very small dental manufacturer. At the time, there was nothing like a composite was out there yet. So, so you followed your boss to W. A. Erickson and Company, which was a small dental manufacturing company. Correct. And then, <clears throat> about one year later, <clears throat> Adaptic Dental Composite came out to the market from Johnson & Johnson. And um, I didn't know, of course, many of uh, my new company, Dr. Erickson, actually the company was owned by Dr. Erickson. And uh, he, he was a dentist? Asked, he was not dentist, he was a chemist also. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So he asked me, uh, actually his advisors, a couple of advisors were there and came to me, Bion, can you make a, a adapt, something like adapting? I said, what to adapt it? I said, dental composite. I said, what's a dental composite? And then, oh, well, he brought us, brought me a package of a dental adaptic. Okay. So I looked at it. There was a brochure or information sheet. Well, that was made out of BCMA and 
filler. So I said, okay, well, let me see if I can make it. So I was looking to buy this GMA in the market. At the time, nobody sold this GMA on the market. So I looked up the structure and since I'm a chemist, so I synthesized my own this GMA. I think that's what uh, eventually put me in dental field and dental resin chemistry and became a, in a way, expert now because I was studying from the beginning synthetic or synthesis of this GMA. So and what, is, what year did you make that first batch of this GMA? 1970. 1970. Yeah, it came out 1969 to the, toward the end of 1969. <clears throat> wow. So, and uh, and then I synthesized 1970, and then I developed a very stable composite catalyst paste part of the composite 1971. Finished. Actually, within one and a half year, I made a better than adapted composite. What I mean is, when you say catalyst, catalyst means peroxide has to be there. With this GMA with a peroxide, it's not stable because the peroxide tends to decompose to free radical and becomes hardened. So I had to find out the good way to do it, and I found it. And that's why we made a much better stable, more stable catalyst system. So from there, Ericsson Company sold to Henry Schein, Darby, HealthCo, you name it. All of the private label we produced from Ericsson at and the time. And what was it called? We didn't make our own. So HealthCo brand or Shine brand or Swedish company. I mean, all of the people we saw, we made OEM company and at, in a way. We just make it, put their label, send it to them. So Ericsson never marketed directly. So as an OEM company, we were successful. And then after about 10 years, uh, I became a little leery. Uh, what I mean is about 40 plus years old. And you start to think about, am I going to work for somebody for the rest of my life? Or could I do something my own? And that's where uh, I was struggling a couple of months internally. I didn't share with my wife at the time on that thought process. <laughs> and then, but maybe two, three months later, my wife said, hey, Pyong, mm, something wrong with you. What's wrong with you lately? And then apparently, he, you know, she realized I'm not normal. <laughs> so I explained what I was struggling with, the thinking process. And then that's how she encouraged me. Well, if you think that way, why don't you try your own? However, you better make it in three years. That's what she said. <laughs> she gave you three years. So what year did you uh, start Bisco then? So Bisco started in 1981, but I quit the company 1980. Ericsson company, I quit 1980. And... Uh, However, I couldn't start immediately because what I signed with the Ericsson Company non-competition agreement, I found out that I could not work in same field or say I couldn't start anything in same area within one year in 50 or 100 miles diameter area in Chicago. So if I went to other state, I could start, but if you're studying, New company, moving family there, it's not a good idea. So I was actually, actually, um, uh, so-called, what, what I call, Dan Matt, Bob Ibsen, found out that I was quitting the Ericsson and he suggested I join them. I said, no, thank you, but you know, I am not going to be employed anymore. <laughs> So I went to San Diego, actually started Carbomedic, now probably no longer existing or sold to somebody else. You know, hydroxapatite coding to 
implant or things like that. Anyway, I started working with that, uh, that company called Carbomedic at the time. And then one year later, I came back to Chicago and started my company, uh, Bisco. So now, do you know why Bisco name? Have you ever heard? Well, I imagine it's Bis GMA company. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, so my full name was Byung In So. Right? How do you spell In? Okay, I, I'll put this screen here. Let's say. Okay, do you see the screen? Yes, Byung In Sa company. Yeah. So if you take an initial Bisco, that's how I named my company. That's came from. Okay, nice. Now. So uh, that's how I started, 1981, actually July 2nd. And uh, but one thing I want to mention here is that when I quit Fisco, I mean the Ericsson, 1980, I realized that dentistry needed a uh, couple of product or adhesives, which will bond to tooth structure and metal substrate. So I was thinking two chemical magic compounds I will have to de invent. At the, so I, after I studied 1981, uh, immediately I was just, I had, I had maybe four or five people working for me. I had a couple of uh, orthodontic adhesive uh, was making for TP Lab, American Orthodontics, things like that, as an OEM label. So while I was doing it, uh, I couldn't afford to spend a lot of time to invent a chemical or a synthesized chemical. So about 1984, now I was uh, enough financially, I could afford to spend time. So I hired a synthetic chemist and so we discussed what chemical will bond to tooth, what chemical will bond to metal. We came up with a structure and then he started synthesizing. Probably about 80, 90 compounds we synthesized. And then we test to tooth and test the metal. Eventually, we came down to so-called, we are using PPDM in all bonds. So PPDM and TSDM, TSDM. Also, we found out any of this, let's say BF, uh, BPDM, will bond to tooth as well as metal. So that's where I introduced, uh, developed all bond, 1990. We finished developing in 1989, introduced 1990. And so now, if you remember that later on, we talk about generation, I'll talk about it, but uh, I said this is fourth generation because up to that, before then was a tenure uh, or a scotch bond. And um, so I called this is fourth generation universal adhesive. The meaning of me universal at the time I meant was it can bond to tooth as well as metal. And then you could do direct and indirect at the same time. So that's why I mentioned as a universal adhesive. Anyway, that the other thing I brought with uh, the universal adhesive, not the uh, all bond, was new concept, total edge and wet bonding concept. Of course, 1990, etching dentin was a taboo. That was, that was a no-no. The, they, were, they were almost like um, getting mad at me. How can you say you can bond to dentin? Because many of the dentists were taught, don't etch dentin. Acid will kill pulp. But I have read enough articles, Prestroms and, you know, Charlie Cox, pulp is killed by bacteria, not the material. So I knew that's where I could say you can etch for better bonding 
And then we found out after you are etching it, you have to have a wet bonding concept. Otherwise, if you etch, you expose collagen. If you dry it, collagen is all collapsed and your adhesive cannot penetrate. That's why you have a poor bonding. So we come up with John Kenka is in, involved here. And uh, did you say John Kenka? Yes, John yeah. Kenka was yeah involved. Well, when I developed, he was, I was giving samples to evaluate, and that's what we were discussing. So, uh, total edge technique, John Kenka should get some credit in that sense. So, we so I did all the research. You know, when you etch dentin, you look on the SEM and you dry it, it's all collapsed. And when you kept moist. In college and you can see all freely floating. And then when you apply adhesive with acetone solvent, acetone has a water chasing effect. So you can just go through to the, you know, the tubules and then push out the water, resin there, and then evaporate cell. Now you have a resin tech form. So that's how we know and, you know, we proved as, a, you know, in terms of SEM evidence and everything like that. But anyway, so when you had Oban with the total edge concept, which was totally against everybody, but we started. So one other thing I can talk about is when we were introducing, normally etchant at the time was 35 or 37 percent phosphoric acid. So if you're talking about total edge, and if you are thinking of 35, it's too strong. So I said, maybe I should develop etchant with a lesser concentration of phosphoric acid. So dentists could feel a little easier. So I made every 5%, 5%, 10%, 15, 20, 25 phosphoric acid solution, and then I etched Enamel, five seconds. Uh, no, the, but 15 to 20 seconds, which one will etch it enough? So I investigated. I found out 10% phosphoric acid will etch cut enamel enough to be bonded. And then what about uncut enamel? Uncut enamel required longer time. Okay, higher concentration. So we looked at it. It took about 32%. 30% was enough to be etched the uncut enamel. So we decided to introduce two etchant. One we call all etch was 10%, and uh, uni etch was 32%. So we had all one kit with the 10% phosphoric acid solution, and then uni kit, which is 32% phosphoric acid containing. So all other ingredients are the same, but etchant was different. We, do you know, we sold 80% dentist was using, I mean, initially 10%. 20% was 32%. However, now we don't even sell 10%. So, you know, come to think of it, uh, making dentist acceptable to total edge concept was actually because we had a 10% weaker phosphoric acid. So ten dentists have felt a little easier when you use first time. So anyway, that's the story along with the old bond. And who was the other dentist you mentioned? Charlie Cox? Yeah, Charlie Cox. He had many articles actually, you know, he was... Uh, in that cat uh, field studied when he was in Alabama, University of Alabama. But mostly, actually, the best guy's paper was uh, Martin Brandstrom's paper. Martin who? Brandstrom. B R A 2 2 dot on top A. Brandstrom. Umla? Yeah, Umla. Brandstrom. Was that the Brandstrom's uh, theory of hydro hydrodynamic theory? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember that. That was amazing. Uh, where, where is, where is <laughs> Martin Brandstrom and Charlie Cox now? Uh, actually, I don't know. Charlie Cox is, I know he's alive, but I don't know where he is. I'm, I'm not 
I don't think he's associated with the university. He kind of disappeared. He became kind of strange lately. And, and what about Martin Brandstrom? Well, he's in, what, Sweden? So I don't Sweden. think he is still in this world. I'm not sure. Interesting. That is uh, amazing. So then, what was the uh, so then what was the next part of your journey? Well, so once you have that made, and then uh, as a Bisco, we just we were developing uh, like uh, orthodontic companies came to me to, to develop adhesive or cement for orthodontic application. So I did that. So we are actually a uh, good supplier for orthodontic universe. That's we are not selling our labels. So yeah, you're an OEM, an original OEM equipment both. manufacturer? Yes. yes. Now what about Japan's role in all this? Um, wasn't there Fuziyama from Japan? Wasn't he involved in this journey? No, actually, Fuziyama was actually in Japan. You know, Japan all went to Selfetch route. Fusama was a Tokyo Medical faculty. He's actually, you know, senior faculty and teacher. So I know him, but uh, let's say he is the first one. First one had the histology slide, came to uh, now in uh, Washington, D.C., NIH. He gave a lecture in front of many famous well-known dentist as well as faculty people showing that etching dentin did not harm pulp. He showed histology data. So, and then I was sitting back and I saw almost all of them were shaking hand when he said that. So that was at the time, you know, U.S. dentist, actually worldwide dentists, all did not believe that uh, using etchant is correct. But what, anyway, year was, what year was that lecture? That lecture could have been maybe 1992, 91 or 92. So I know his story. What he did is actually he was, so Japan, clear for the Krari people, had a chemist made some original Krari uh, product okay, with MDP and then gave just uh, for some uh, Japanese professor is a sensei, right? Sensei. So he had a test made specimen, a dentin bonded specimen, and then put into a water bottle, and then wintertime put on to right next to the window, which is cold. So well, he didn't use a modern equipment. He just put in there for sunshine, you know, uh, cold and hot weather, and then maybe a couple of years later, he looked at it. That was good. <laughs> so he believed in, he believed in that chemical bonding is possible with that. And then he tried to do histological study. And then he showed that etching dentin, if you did good bonding, no harm done on pulp chamber. So that's what he was talking. But that was the Fusama. But Japan, because of, I know why, because of the, national insurance system. You cannot spend a lot of time etching, bonding, self etch direction. So total etch never, I mean, of course at the time nobody knew total etch, but his idea, etching dentin is no problem, we can do good bonding. Nobody picked up in Japan or anywhere else. I picked up, I made his philosophy proven. So that's why I I know him well. Also, actually, you know Ray Bertolotti? Absolutely. Yeah, Ray Bertolotti, every year he's, I'm sure he's still doing in Yosemite seminar. So he invited me and Fusayama and John Kenka to Yosemite, his seminar for one week. So that's where we met, uh, I mean, Fusayama. And then also I had to he has to go to Seattle ADA meeting at the time. So actually, Hosama and me flew together to Washington, I mean, the Seattle. And at the time, we shared a lot of, uh, you know, ideas and the conversation I had. 
What, what yeah. is he doing now? Is he still working? He passed away. He passed away about five years ago. Yeah. So uh, it's that, kind that, of that was four legends: you, Fuziyama, Bertolotti, John Kanka. That's <laughs> uh, those are the four heads of uh, Dental Mount Rushmore. <laughs> we should do that. We should make a we we should we should make a Mount Rushmore and put I'm those four sure. heads on there. Okay. And call it call okay. it Mount Bonding more. <laughs> you know, lo looking back at this, um, it seemed to um, the, the scientific revolution in materials is what was the foundation for the whole cosmetic revolution. Right. Yeah. The only reason uh, the eighties and nineties and two thousands was all about uh, bleaching, bonding veneers is because it was a revolution in dental materials. Correct. Yeah. And and, well, and, you, and and you were a big part of that. I mean, congratulations on that. I mean, you you basically changed dentistry. I mean, you, we went from uh, gold and amalgam, and partials and dentures, to the entire whiter, brighter, sexier teeth cosmetic revolution, <laughs> which all came from fundamental research and development that gave dentists these new technologies. Yeah, I agree to that statement is that if you want to do cosmetic or aesthetic dentistry, you cannot do without adhesion dentistry. If you don't know how to bond correctly, well, you're failing. So I think we gave, or at least adhesive dentistry development in theory plus practical in application, all of these things were essential for me and to me. So that's why I spent a lot of time doing research and, and then writing paper, you know, talking to people, things like that. And then at the end, actually, I heard many dentists, dentists are not keen with the chemistry. So when I, I when my lecture always include, I cannot just say, do this way, do this way. I have to give a reason why you do that. that that is my nature. So when I do, when I give a reason, I have to include some chemistry. And uh, while they, some people appreciate, some people, oh, I don't know anything about that. And they kind of, but many people asked me, uh, hey, Byung, I know you talked, let's say, one hour, or two hours. I didn't get half of them. I wish I could find something to read it. That will help greatly. So that's why I decided to write a book. I decided to write a book. And uh, so it took a long time. You know, I'm not a good writer, but I can write something in chemistry or translation of it, material-wise. So I did it. And then I published, that was about five, six years ago. Is it on Amazon? Yeah, actually, I, I can you see this book? Oh, nice. Principles of Adhesion Dentistry. Nice. Ryan, can you find me that? So that came out, and how, how are you selling it? Aegis, Aegis. Aegis Publishing, Aegis Publishing. Yeah, this is the one. Mm -hmm. And it's, cool. on, it's on Amazon. Is it on Amazon? I, I'm not, you know, I don't follow up. <laughs> So it's published 2013. Um, you know what would be uh, you know what would be really really nice uh, marketing for that. Yeah, is I, to, I think so. Um, I, I think a really great way to market it would be to write an article for Dental Town Magazine summarizing your book, and okay. uh, we'll put that in the magazine. That goes to 125,000 dentists, and I've been begging you for since 2004. To put an online CE course on Dental Town because these kids now uh, they they don't like to go to conventions and and all that <laughs> stuff. We we put up four hundred courses, Byung, and they've been okay. listened to a million times. Yeah, that's a good idea. We actually, I think we were talking. Well, Carol was talking to me. Well, one day we should do this each chapter, maybe once or something like that. But yeah, I remember to hear. Hearing that, mm -hmm. yeah, let, let's do that, Byung. It'd be uh, it'd be such an honor uh, to have you uh, on there. That would just be uh, just amazing. Uh, I would I would absolutely love that. And okay, um, sure. 
Yeah, so we'll do so we'll do an article in the magazine about your book, and then okay. an online course. And uh, and I'm also um, trying to change the culture in the United States where the United States dentists for years they they um, they only want to listen to other dentists. They don't want to listen to the dental company because they think the dental company is trying to sell them something. <laughs> Yet when you go to Europe, you go to the clone meeting. You don't have all these lectures when the dentist wants to know about a company. They just like to go talk to the owner of the company and Americans. Uh, it, it's a totally different culture. And I, I think the IDF meeting in Cologne is a far more psychologically healthy, functional atmosphere because the dentists there are just, they want to shake the hands of the guy who invented this implant or adhesive right. or whatever. That is true. That is true. They, yeah. they want to go to the horses about them and the American dentist. When I started dental town in 1998, they didn't want any dental manufacturers on there. In fact, today, Orthotown still won't. Orthotown, you could only get on if you are an orthodontist because they don't want to hear anybody <laughs> from all these companies for whatever <laughs> insane reasons. But but I stuck yeah. to my guns in 98. They said, well, these guys are trying to sell something. And I'm like, what are, what are you, a volunteer? What do you do, free dentistry? How come you can sell root canals and crowns to, to your patients, but, you know, but... Bisco can't sell you a bonding agent. I mean, it, it's crazy. The only reason dentists look so good is because of the companies like you that you created that made us look so good. And and, and if you didn't make it these amazing <laughs> products, then we'd be uh, sitting outside on a rug with uh, stuff we bought from Home Depot. I want to I want to be a critic of yours though. Okay. I wanna, now now I want to throw you under a bridge. Okay. In before bonding before adhesion these fillings were amalgam and they were half mercury and you never find mercury in a multivitamin no one no one recommends that you eat it to grow hair or anything the other half is silver zinc copper and tin which are all antibacterial um silver is used well, how, by how pediatric you know those things uh, and <laughs> so it, it seems it seems like when you go listen to adhesive dentistry courses they always talk about how strong their bond is and, and the composite, how uh, strong the wear rate is. But in the, in the field, Byung, my fillings don't fail because they wore down and fell out. They fail because they were eaten by gram, you know, from bacteria yeah, from the biofilm. Yeah. And do you think that the amalgam was better for resistance against the biofilm than the cosmetic revolution of making these uh, these fillings, these tooth colored fillings. Yes, actually, actually, amalgam was more resistant and more successful because first it's anti antibacterial, even mercury or zinc or you know all those things. That's one thing, but I think more than that is expansion. You know, what, amalgam when you cure it, it's kind of slightly expanded. So you have no gaps, you just, if there was a gap and then the corroded material will block up. So that was a reason that, although it didn't look good, but it, you know, used the purpose. So that's amalgam. And so you talk about composite. Composite part is actually uh, mostly educational gap between dentist and manufacturer of adhesive. What I mean is adhesive, at least in the market, some of them are good, some of them are not good. I mean, I can admit that. But if you use correctly, should perform pretty good. That's one issue. The other issue is a composite. Composite, it's all, composite means what? Monomer and filler. As long as you have monomers, when you cure it, it shrinks. Okay, so now when you shrink, so-called the shrinkage stress is exerting on the cavity. So what, what the stress does, try to, if it's not bonded well, will immediately debond, especially gingival floor, because all, everything is light curing, lifting up. Well, what's the result? Sensitivity. Sensitivity is when you have a gap between filling material and tooth. That means you have a dentin tubules open. You know that's where hydrodynamic theory comes in. 
as soon as you pump the fluid, you have sensitivity. So um, nowadays there are products called the bulk filling material. Everybody goes for it because dentists like to use just a one shot deal. Well, if it's small cavity, maybe okay. If a large cavity, even though it's a bulk fill, I, if I am a dentist for my wife or my kids, I wouldn't go bulk fill. I mean, use the same bulk fill material, at least to build up so you minimize shrinkage stress. So adhesion is fighting against the shrinkage stress. So if you do immediately, you immediately debound it. If it didn't do immediate debounding, because stress is still there, eventually it will crack. So what I'm saying is here is you have to use adhesive correctly and then you should minimize shrinkage stress of whatever you're using composite. So in that respect, actually self-cure composite is a little better than Lyco composite. Why? Lyco composite is you're curing within 10 seconds. Shrinkage stress just comes all of a sudden versus self-cure slowly cures, right? Two, three minutes. So your shrinkage stress will be a little bit negated by flexing the surface of composite. So again, dentist does not like that. Also, occlusal part, self-cure is not aesthetically good. So if, if I am becoming ideal dentist, up to DJ, I'll use a self-cure. Enamel portion, like your composite. That will be my world of ideal bonding. And that's what I can say. If you try to shortcut, you will reward it. You will be rewarded with some problems. I well, you, you should, you should uh, do a, an online CE course on this. In fact, you might want to do several courses on this. I mean, this is very profound. Sure. But but the thing I don't understand is um you know I get uh, on, on the uh, dual care that it's not quite as pretty as the self care but you know what maybe that's true for women but for men I mean I'm a dentist for 54 years I never see men's molars and that's where most of the recurrent decay and sensitivity is not on the anterior incisors and I mean so I grew up I mean like all of my restorations are gold and you you, you haven't that's seen one lot. yet. <laughs> you, you you haven't seen one yet, and and yeah. people don't see posterior molars in men ever. Maybe in a woman, sometimes they might see, but uh, I, I I think some of this uh, extreme cosmetics on a back molar is pretty silly. That is true, but I'm not talking about only molar, maybe pre molars. Right. Uh, size wise, size issue here because. Bulk shrink of stress is related to the bulk. But when I look when I look at the insurance data where they're you know where they're doing hundreds of millions of claims you know you you then they line up the thirty two teeth it's just those four six year molars where you have these monstrous spikes they're the tooth most likely to get a filling a crown a root canal yeah. extracted an implant so a bridge I mean so on those four molars in fact that is the most uh amazing thing i want to talk to you about that um the minute that a first molar a six-year molar erupts i mean it, it's the tooth most likely to have everything go wrong with it <laughs> what would you what would you recommend uh for the initial sealant do you do you believe in sealants i mean you're you're an organic chemist when you're acid etching a six-year molar you're acid etching pits and fissures filled with debris and crud whatever do you think a sealant is a real ideology, or do you think those Are fissures you should resin be removed? Sealant, resin sealant after etching, applying sealant on young tooth? That's what you're talking about? Yes. Well, I think uh, pit and fissure is the source of bacteria invasion. So, yes, I agree. Pit and fissure sealant will not last long. If you don't etch it, you don't, it doesn't last long because you cannot adhere well. So, uh, but idea of applying sealant 
in any form. There are so many things that lately came out, right? Certain resin filling with glass, I know people make it and so on. But application of sealant, I think it's very uh, clinically worthwhile, although it has to be checked maybe, you know, every six months or one year. But, but, would, you, expect- but would you have to check it every six months or a year if you r- remove the pits and fissures, if you took a fissurotomy burr or micro air abrasion oh. or something? And uh, then you fill, and- fill. Yeah. And it'd be basically an occlusal composite, which would be called a preventive resin restoration. Uh, well, I, to me, you know, less invasion should be better. Without even, without making a little rich, you, you can still etch and seal. So now the sealant, again, this is a concept. Uh, or sealant is normally you don't have any um, solvent, just resin. Resin itself, it's not easy to penetrate. Okay, so uh, actually we studied this. If you apply adhesive first, adhesive has solvent. So now wherever you had the fish and sealant, this little uh, hole there. If you etch and then apply sealant, no, the adhesive primer up first, and then you apply sealant, the sealant will go far into the fissure, pit and fissure area. That's what we know. That has been published uh, from the University of Illinois. A lot of of kids are... um... (laughs) confused about all the generations of bonding agents. I mean, it just seems to be, I mean, it seems like every other year there's a new generation. What what generation are we on now? Are, are okay, we at 10 well, now? Are we in double digits? That's why I made a slide for that. Okay, first I will show you a slide and then explain. <laughs> but, okay, now you see it? Nice slide. Okay, so what I showed there is uh, I went through all the generation. And uh, I had an arrow with the uh, old one, two scratch one multi-purpose. Actually, that's when I introduced 1990. I explained to you, I called fourth generation universal adhesive. And then six months or one year later, scratch one multi-purpose came in because all one, two, you could do direct, indirect, everything. So that's why they had introduced the multi- scratch one, two became multi-purpose later on. So that's fourth generation. Let's just start from there because the first generation, I don't think they called themselves first generation. And then clear field bond, scotch bond came in second. And then third is tenure and scotch bond two. So 1990, all two became a total edge concept. And then in addition, I explained that wet bonding concept was there. And then dentists a little bit complained, ah, this is too many steps. So we simplified to, you know, one step or prime and bond or single bond. That was the still total edge. So, so that number of step at the last column, and then Japan came up with self edge system. There was a two layer or two step primer and bond. Okay, and then sixth generation. If you look at it. 2000 uh, prompt LPOP was example. It was a, a kind of a simple for dentist, but there was a very bad product. I can tell. Was you that, that by SP back when it was in Germany? S- well, yeah, yeah. That's what that's what SP. Actually, this is the product developed by SP and 3M introduced as their product. But I can tell you that was a very bad product. Uh, do you, know then, where, do you know where the so name? Do you know where the uh, name Prompto Pop came from? No. Yeah, I uh, I talked to the marketing director. I go, where'd you get that name? He goes, well, prompt means fast, and it looks like a lollipop, so we yeah, called yeah, it right. Prompto Pop. Oh, right, I it thought. Like that. <laughs> but there was that, and that. So now I have that two bottle parentheses in there. That means that is a bottle, and the other bottle you mix it in 
one step. Mix it and then you apply as one step. And then Iban and Iban came up. They said, "Oh, you know, this is again improved. Instead of two bottle, it's one bottle. That's not good because sulfates. What that means? Sulfates means you have acidic component, acidic monomers in it. If you put acid with the monomers, monomer is not going to survive long time. Anyway, I don't know how I, they didn't know that. But anyway, they came out. They called actually." You know, seventh generation. So let's say okay, because simplify the bottle number. So that's the end of generation. Actually, I can say that. And then I put eighth generation as a universal of these. So now, how do you remember all this generation? Forget about it. Can Please. you can you email me these slides? Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay, or great. Ship it out. And uh, so let, okay, do you see it? I do. Okay, now this one, I made it. I was actually made this slide with the animation, but you cannot animate here. So I combined all together. I gave it a little bracket. So first, adhesive by layers. You know, dentists apply primer or binding resin. So each is one layer. So if you look at that uh, concept, so left side of the bracket, total H3 step. Selfish two step. I have an example there. Okay, clear for SE band as a selfish all band two. So, what do you do? You apply total edge case, you apply red line indicates, and then that's etched. But uh, animation will take off that, but now this is not animated, so it's still there. So, you wash out. First thing you apply primer. Next one is the bonding resin. So, now it's a two layer, right? So now you go right side of the column, the uh, bracket or a row or whatever that is. Now this is a um, total edge single step or single bond, self edge single step or total edge two step single step. Can you, put, can you put the animation in a YouTube video? The YouTube video is very easy to share on social media. Oh, okay. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. Put it on a YouTube. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so now you see this, you have uh, one layer remaining resin on the right side. So now you see two layer adhesive, one layer adhesive. So one layer adhesive is to dentist, it's a simple. They will like it. However, as I mentioned, LPOP like material was so acidic, so hydrophilic. Well, because you have to have water, acidic, etc. So it just cured it, but immediately uh, water will attack or saliva will attack. It's not good. So it's called very hydrophilic. So that's why Bisco never had a self-etch material until all one three or all one SE came out. Because I knew so much, we did a lot of research on this area. We have something like um, Franklin Tate, David Pashley, we worked on working on l pop like product. If you applied it, like cured it, you put composite on top, and then later when you look at it, water from the antenna tubule can go through cured adhesive and accumulate all underneath composite. And then when you test it, you can see water droplet right knee, right under the composite. That's very bad. So we called the all cured simplified self-fetch adhesive is permeable and permeable membrane, hydrophilic and permeable membrane, meaning water can attack. So that's why I could never market that kind of product. So I decided to develop hydrophobic material, all one three, all one SC. How I did it, it's too much, so I'm not gonna sort of made hydrophobic. So hydrophobic means the water cannot go through. Okay. And then I found out that through many six years of actually clinic uh, lab test result, if you make hydrophobic material, one layer adhesive is good enough. You don't have to have a 
two layer adhesive. So that's what Olva knew, universal adhesive. So universal adhesive, even though it's one layer, because it is made hydrophobic. Again, you can ask me, but it will take quite a bit of time. So I don't think it's a good time to do it. And some other time, if you, we have another opportunity, to, you can do that. Because of its hydrophobic, now you can be one layer. Now also we have total etchable or self etchable because it contains MDP acidic monomer I mentioned, but with a small amount of water. Whereas other self etched products, all actually all universal adhesive currently in the market has more than 10% water in it. Okay, that water makes the adhesive acidic, pH 2.3456. Okay, that brings another subject of called compatibility between adhesive and self care cement. So again, that is if you have, so let's say you apply the scotch band, scotch band multi universal applied, you dry 10 seconds. Do you think the wall of water, which has about 10% water, will be evaporated or still there? Answer is water is still there. Then the pH is still 2.7. Well, then acidity is still there. And then you put self care material on top. Now, self care has a base, a catalyst, and base. Base contains tertiary amine, aromatic tertiary amine, which is called the base again. So, adhesive acid base neutralize it, quaternary ammonium compound. That means catalyst base cannot react to free, create free radical to give you polymerization. So therefore, right interface where you need cement is not polymerized, debonding. So that's called adhesive self care composite or you know resin cement compatibility. That's Another issue, but you, all self etch adhesive has one monomer acidic, mostly MDP, and then some amount of water. Ranging, we have 2.5% water. All the others are 10 to about 16% of water in there. So, what's the the difference is that if you had only 2.5% water, shows acidic nature when you apply it, but when you dry it, 10 seconds, all of water is gone. So it's no longer acidic. That's why your self care cement can have no problem, no compatibility issue. Again, this subject not many people know. So this is called incompatibility between adhesive, acidic adhesive, and dual pure cement. Dual pure means like pure and self curable. So that's the issue here. Okay. So uh, universal adhesive, as we know, we tested. We tested. Scotch band U is very hydrophobic. If you can evaporate water off. So we tested how long it takes to evaporate water is about 90 seconds. No dentist will do their job. So when you use all universal adhesive, when you dry after application, when you dry it, 10 seconds will not evaporate all of the water in the universal adhesive. That gives you no problem with the immediate light cure composite, but if you use on top of, uh, with the self-care material, that, that right inter at interface will not polymerize, therefore you have a lower bonding or deep bonding. That is issue. Again, I don't think any, many people know that, but uh, we published this uh, once in a while, but not, we are working on to compare every universal adhesive, measure pH, measure water amount, and, uh, and then bonding test, and then aging, one year. Immediately, you cannot distinguish it unless you age it. So we are aging it right now. So that's what, what's going on. 
But, uh, you know, in terms of chemistry knowledge, we, me and our chemist knows quite a bit. But when, he to when I talk like this, well, that's because he's proud of it. So I don't do that. It's really a chemist point of view I look at. I think, um, like I say, I, I think it's a weird culture in the United States when it comes to dentists and manufacturers. Like I say, in Europe, this is not an issue. European dentists want to know what these amazing, I mean, you were so passionate about this. You started an entire company. Uh, you've been doing this uh, since uh, for basically almost th what, how long? How old is Visco now? Thirty-six years. I mean, you've been doing this for thirty-six years. Probably two-thirds of the people listening to you right now aren't even thirty-six years old. Um, yeah. uh, you know, I enjoy I, I, I enjoy your passion. I, I enjoy the trust, and I, I think it's very dysfunctional for people to uh, say, um, you know, they, they they have these thoughts in their head like. Uh, I like Jesus going through the temple, kicking over the money changers or something. Like that. But but what the money changers were, those were, those were currency exchangers, and they were taking a big margin. But the American Dental Association, I mean, they, they still won't even let the people on the floor take a credit card and make a sell because they're a nonprofit. Well, you know, maybe you shouldn't follow a nonprofit. Maybe that's not good business advice. I mean, I, I'd rather I'd rather take my business advice from a millionaire. Uh, than a non-profit, but yeah, it, it's weird, and, and I don't have a problem with it. I, I stuck to my guns and said Dental Town will be for anyone who works full-time in the sovereign profession dentistry, whether you're a hygienist, assistant, a dental manufacturer, a scientist. I mean, you have a bachelor's in science, a master's in science, and a PhD, and most of these dentists, when they go learn about bonding, they'll go listen to a dentist lecture, and if that dentist was pulled to the side by an organic chemist, he, he, would, he would show he knows nothing. I mean, how many of these dentists could go one-on-one -on -one with your standard organic chemist? Well, well, they are not trained in depth, but when, I, when you talk about lectures, so I listen once in a while. Some of the people they talk, I mean, lectures are not correctly talking about. I find many of them. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's obvious. I mean, I, I, I know several scientists that over the years that work for uh, Bisco, 3M, Ivoclair, and they just sit there and, and show me you know, the, the transcripts of what, what, what these people are saying, that it's just completely wrong. And then, and then uh, um, yeah, so, so like if you go to Dental Town, you should make a, a, a great online course because that was my next question. A lot of these young dentists are asking on Dental Town, um, you know, they just come out of school. They they want to learn more. They want to learn more about adhesion, um, direct composites. You know, you, you can't do direct composites and cosmetic dentistry if you don't understand adhesion. How would, What would you tell that um, young student if they wanted to learn more? How could they really learn more? Well, they'll have to come to Visco. <laughs> Actually, that's... Very good question, but, well, you have to uh, be able to attend. Well, first, you have to select the right person, person's lecture, and then listen. But if you go to most of the lecturers in the circuit, they don't even know, except for you, what is the science behind. So how can they teach? So to me, young dentists from school probably has to learn from book basics first before you can apply it. So I know, actually my book is translated in China, Chinese last year. They are a very, I mean, again, we talked about younger dentists. Young dentists, they come to listen to who, who is lecturing, let's say, three, four times a month, pay $200. And then this, this lecturing guy is a young guy, 37 years old, Chinese dentist. But he, went, he came to UCLA, he went to USC, he went to Germany. I mean, he's a kind of progressive guy, learned everything. 
And then they approached me, actually. His friend was a uh, publisher, so apparently they were looking for some book, theoretical basic adhesion book. There was no other book. They found my book. So they approached me, can we publish your book? So I said, okay. So he picked about three, four professors. They got each chapter translated. And then our chemist here at the BISCO kind of reviewed it, okayed it. So started February of 2016 and published in October. Amazing. But so I went uh, inaugural, well, when you launched the book, I went there to lecture. All of them were young, younger dentists. I couldn't see many older dentists, but younger dentists are very eager to learn in that area. I go to Korea too, but younger dentists are willing to learn, spend some time. Aged dentist, probably not. Uh, so, only thing you can do is I by, by reading articles, but you don't know what where to start. But this book has a lot of reference. I think that's one of the strengths. Is a lot of research res uh, references here as well. So you can pick up basics from the book, and then if you want to read more, you can go articles. That's one thing I can suggest. But we do this kind of, uh, in in the Bisco, uh, Bisco, Bisco experience they call it. So university like UCLA, University of Texas, Houston, LSU, they are resident lecturers, professors, restorative people. They come to Bisco by the number between ten to twenty. Then we spend three days to give a basic course. And I talk about adhesion and so on. So uh, again, like a funding right now, when you say adhesion, adhesion, now it involves zirconia. Zirconia bonding, everybody thought you cannot bond to zirconia. But we came up with a Z prime, which allows to bond to zirconia. So if you put zirconia, short crown of zirconia, you must bond, otherwise you'll fall off. So that's what we did. And then, you know, we talk, actually this book covers the zirconia bonding chemistry and what to do, and then also bonding to porcelain or Emacs. Again, I find that part not many people understood correctly. So I put in chapters for zirconia and bonding to uh, silica, meaning porcelain or silica containing, you know, aesthetic material, porcelain or uh, Emacs. So what do you think of all this zirconia replacing the PFM? Did you ever think in your lifetime that the famous porcelain fused the metal crown which replaced the full gold crown, would now just be plummeting in market share. Um, it's almost going extinct like the dinosaurs, being replaced with zirconia. Uh, well, actually, I didn't expect anything until last few years. You know, I was, then I saw zirconia come, oh, well, not few, five years, maybe five years. At the time, it was uh, actually, all oh, zirconia is such a strong material. I thought you cannot even scratch it, or if sandblasting wouldn't work on zirconia. So I picked up, I sandblasted the zirconia surface. Well, I can see indentation under SEM. Oh, this is, I mean, beyond my expectation at least, because everybody bragged about this is a very strong material. I thought you couldn't even sandblast it, but you can sandblast and then, uh, Sandblasting helps. Do you think a zirconium crown should be cemented or bonded into place? Oh, it all depends. If it's, if you are, let's say, fully retentive, you can cement it. Cement. Nowadays, self-adhesive cement or 
some people go as ion base, but it's fully retentive. If it's fully retentive, anything can be used, old cement, right? But if a short crown with a tapering, right, short crown, you must bond it. That's where you need the zirconia bonding primer, and then rest of them are same. So how would you bond a zirconium crown? Name the name brands. Na name how you would bond a zirconium crown that did not have a lot of retention. Okay, well, first, two treatment is either, so let's go to this way. Most of the crown, short crown, that means you are fairly close to pulp chamber or not much dental left. So you, you may have a problem of sensitivity. So I suggest that universal adhesive, selective etch mode, meaning you etch only enamel, dentin, don't etch it, and then use universal adhesive, preferably all but universal, which is the best for that purpose. And then zirconia crown side, you will first lightly sandblast, meaning about 40, 45 PSI, because the cornea has a crystalline structure. If you have a too big particle, you change the um, clean, uh, crystalline structure from tetragonal to monoclinic. So we don't want to do that. So you suggest this is an accepted tech, uh, procedure. And what, what is your what is your recommended sandblaster? Sandblaster, who is used to be micro, you remember that? Uh, the micro etch, was that from Danville Engineering? Yeah, 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 we use that. Yeah, we use that Danville's micro etch. Yeah, I still use mine, and I, gosh, I, I think they're 20 years old. <laughs> yeah, that's so. And then, the important part is how, how big a particle you use, and then what the pressure you use. And what size particle for the. Uh, ideally, the literature wise, ideally 30 micron. 30 micron. Okay, 120 micron, 100 micron. And what, is the, what is the material? Aluminum or. Um, aluminum oxide. But so aluminum called, oxide? Yeah, aluminum oxide. Sand. They call sand or aluminum oxide silica particle. Aluminum oxide. Aluminum yeah. oxide, 30 microns. Ideal. Ideal. You can Ideal. use a 50 micron. So 30 to 50 micron particle about 40 to 45 PSI, okay. and then maybe about one to two centimeter away, sandblasted. Again, another uh, study showed instead of, this is a horizontal surface, instead of going this way, 90 degree bombarding, go angled, 60 degree angle sandblasting. So that gives you more retention. You know, theoretically, you can think if you did indent it here, you have created this type of indentation. If you go this way, you have this type of indentation. So you are kind of uh, helping to hold mechanical retention part. I mean, that is, so let's go back. Alumina, 30 micron, ideal to 30 micron to 50 micron. Pressure 40 to 40, 45 PSI with about 60 degree angle to the flat surface angle. And then you rinse it, you have to wash it. And then ideally, ideally you, normally what dentist does, then after you prepare it, you go to try in. When you try in, try in saliva contains Phosphate. Phosphate will react with the zirconia. You will contaminate the surface. So bonding primer will not have a chance to work on it. So if two things. Try it first, and then you sandblast it, clean it, and then Z prime it. Zirconia primer. We call Z prime. Viscose product there with Z prime. Then dry it, and then use your choice of adhesive. Again, in our case, it will be uh, all on you or one step, whatever you, that part is not that important. And then cement-wise, now you have a choice of many, but uh, from Bisco will be 
either TerraSAM or all dual link universal. So it's a dual QCMN. Zirconia has a very low light penetration ability, opaque. So light cure won't work completely. So you have to have some self cure ability. So when you use the dual cure cement, only what I suggest is don't try to cure it. Give it time to self cure it. As I mentioned, self cure alone, if it's a good dual cure cement, the self cure will be good enough. So let it self cure. And then at the end, maybe one, two minutes later, margin, exposed margin, you can just like cure just to give a little better curing at the margin because it's oxygen emission is there. I'll give you one example. I had, you know, had some crown and uh, my dentist used dual link and he like cured. I could feel, I could feel tightening effect. That means the shrinkage stress all of a sudden. So that's why I said, if you're using dual cure cement, let it self cure first. And then like cure later on at the margin, just to confirm the margin. <clears throat> I think that's what I will say, how to bond short zirconia crown. You know, Byung, um, you could, if you created a complete online C course on Dental Town, you could educate so many dentists from Kansas to Kathmandu. I mean, it'd be the fastest, most efficient way you could bring so many people up to speed on the PhD science behind all of these uh, concepts. Well, so, uh, you know, I'm not that young. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very, honestly, I'm very uh, happy to hear that. Okay, I will be, as long as my health allows, I will do anything. Well, I First, mean, why, you wouldn't want to lecture a hundred all-day presentations in a hundred different cities when right. you could just make the lecture online one time and then ship that, it out to every country. I agree. Okay, let's do it then. Yeah, I, I, I'd, really, I'd really love this. And, and your credibility, your honesty... Uh, your textbook, you've been, you have been—you started at the very beginning of this revolution. These kids are very confused. They hear a lot of uh, misinformation. They hear a lot of incomplete information. And you could just thoroughly educate them from A to Z on this. I want to I end on, um, well, I, I still got, can I still ask you two more questions? No problem. Go ahead. Okay, so your, um, your daughters, um, you have three daughters. They work, they work for you for years. A lot of a lot of women dentists are listening to you right now, and they're kind of cringing because when they get out of dental school, they're going to go work with their dad at, at their dad's practice. And a lot of them, it just it's just like it's just kind of nerve wracking. What advice would you give to the old guys like you and me listening to you, and to the young girls that are going to go work with their dad? How how do you do that? And and do you ever uh, do you ever get in trouble? Does, does your wife ever uh, have to intervene and say, D -d -d "Is she the referee?" Or how, how does that relationship work? Well, in that area, I'm probably very fortunate. Um, I never had that type of issues, mainly because I behave and they behave. So, for a parent side. I will say that, hey, younger generations are very different than the way we were educated, especially old Korean boy, right? So you will have to not, should not try to dominate, probably try to listen in and give respect to them. At the same time, the younger side should do the same. That's the only way I see it. And uh, also younger people should acknowledge their parents' side because they are already established. And if you get in there, first thing they should do, maybe five, six years, learn business, learn how to treat, how to react with the client. 
before they exert it. This, I want to do this way, probably uh, delay it, not immediately. I'm sure younger generation and you know, their parent generation are not exactly thinking same way, but initially, younger people should listen in to their parents' side first so that you have a smooth transition for long term. Wise words. My final question. You look way younger than you should. I mean, you look very, very young. And a lot of my friends tell me that you um, take anti-aging very serious. What, what are your, are you doing anything high tech to preserve your life expectancy? <laughs> Not really, but I look after my health, but I do exercise. Uh, actually, seriously, uh, also, I play golf, so actually I was signed up with a smart golf fitness. So what that means is you develop your muscle more related to golf swing or to prevent injuries, things like that. That's one thing I do, but also I take the vitamins seriously. Uh, vitamin C, I am a very high dose of vitamin C, meaning maybe between 3,000 to 6,000 a day, milligram. Really? Yeah. So, so you recommend that? three to 6,000 milligrams of vitamin that's, C a day? Yeah, I know some people are taking 9,000 milligrams, but so not, there's normally vitamin C has 500 milligram, 1,000 milligram. I buy 1,000 milligram big bottle. Uh, lately, I take uh, one pill, one breakfast, lunch, dinner, but I used to two pills each, so that becomes 6,000. Now, so why do you it's... like vitamin C? I know you're very into chemical chemistry, chemical engineering. What What is it about vitamin C, ascorbic acid, that you're so enamored with? Yeah, of? this is, a, in a way, you're fighting against the free radicals. Yeah, free radicals. You know, all the free radicals are bad thing. You're doing something bad, but your vitamin C will pick up that. Well, that's what I believe. I know, I read a long time ago, you know, the Laurel, uh, Nobel Laureate, Paul Lining, the chemist, very yes. famous chemist. He was in, in it, vitamin C. He kind of suggested this is the best thing for you to do. So he was actually taking, he talked about it. So I listened in that part, and i still working on the vitamin C. Do you take any other vitamins? Okay, yeah, vitamin C, and then also folic acid, uh, a few other things, folic acid, niacin. That's mainly because of uh, to create a better blood cell. Because I find I have a lower red blood cell level last few years, so I'm taking that. But anyway, yeah, I I do take uh, supplement, but vitamin C, uh, vitamin B, B12. The vitamin B complex. Actually, what, daily. What about diet? Are you vegan or do you eat meat? What about that? I eat anything, everything. But not large quantity. I eat smaller quantities. All That's, right. Well, hey, well, uh, uh, I again, <laughs> I can't tell you uh, how over the years it was so amazing to listen to you lecture. I've, I listened to you lecture several times. Um, I've been to your facility a couple of different times. I don't know if you remember that. Um, yeah. and, uh, I just think, uh, I, I just think you're a legend and you've done so much for dentistry and it was just a huge honor to have you come on and talk today. And I really, um, hope you, uh, uh, write an article for dental town magazine and create some online courses. Cause I don't think there's anyone who could teach it better than you. And uh, congratulations on all you've done for dentistry. Thank you very much, Howard. I am um, actually, 
I enjoyed very much. I didn't know time went so fast, and uh, I am open to any time. If I have time, you have time. We can always. If you ever want to come back on the show, you just you just you just let me know. Just email me back, and if you if there's yeah. something else you want to come back and say, if you ever want to do it again, you have an open invitation. Thank you, and then I will. So maybe next time we pick a subject, small subject, and talk about it. That's you. Be- you pick the subject. <laughs> you, you, you email when because I because yeah. what I love the most is is when you're passionate about something. I, I don't want to talk to you about something you're not passionate about, but if right. any if any dental subject all of a sudden makes you very passionate, um, then call me back and we'll talk about that again. Okay, great. All right, have a great day. Thank you. And I want to say hello to all of your audience and uh, have a good day, rest of the day.